and welcome to the Bad Bad News Podcast YouTube channel. I'm so excited to start this new venture with you all um, and to share with you all the video recordings of our interviews. Um, now you can put a face to the voice. Um, so for our first video uh, recorded interview, we got to interview Dr. Mark Pingle. Um, a little backstory here, I had the honor to have Dr. Pingle as my thesis advisor for my master's in economics. We had studied the externalities um, affecting housing segregation along with income inequality. Um, and since we're both very interested in the field of macroeconomics, I thought it would be great for him to come on and, and address many people's concerns about inflation. Um, but before we get started, I want to give him a formal introduction. Uh, Dr. Pingle has scores of publications in macroeconomics, behavioral economics, and experimental economics. Um, he has served as the chair of the University of Nevada's Department of Economics and as the president of the International Society for the Advancement of Behavioral Economics. Um, desiring to more personally facilitate economic development in northern Nevada, he shifted a large, a large portion of his efforts towards the development of entrepreneurial talent. Uh, he spearheaded the effort to create the entrepreneurship program at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and he subsequently spearheaded the creation of the Community Entrepreneurship Nevada effort and remains devoted to seeing entrepreneurial capacities developed at the university and in the community. He's been a big supporter of my podcast and all my entrepreneurial endeavors, so I'm really excited to have him on. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So first off, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us, Dr. Pingle. I know it, you know I've been receiving a lot of questions about inflation, and I'm really glad you'll be lending your thoughts um, on it all. Yeah, happy to be here. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, there's been no doubt that COVID-19 has created tremendous disturbances in the economy. And one major component that's been overlooked has been inflation. And now with the Fed's recent monetary uh, expansionary policies we've seen, and based on the quantity theory of money, which basically states that the general price level of goods and services is directly proportional to the amount of the money supply, we should be seeing a rise in inflation happening. Why do you think inflation has not risen yet? And do you believe it will? Uh, I think there are two reasons we haven't seen it. And whether or not we will, will depend upon some Federal Reserve actions, I think, and people's behavior. Uh, you're correct. The quantity theory of money directly relates the quantity of money to prices. The assumption there, the important assumption, is that if people have more liquidity, they'll spend it on goods and services. But there is another option. The other option is they can spend it on assets. And so what it means individually is rather than spending your money, you save it. And there are many savings vehicles, stocks, bonds, real estate. If you look at the data, it indicates because prices haven't been going up of goods and services, but prices of stocks, bonds, real estate have. Uh, and it's very clear if you look at the data that um, disproportionately the money has been going there rather than into goods and services. And so that's why the quantity theory of money isn't really explaining things right now. That's reason one. Reason two is that uh, when the Federal Reserve purchases assets and the main asset that they've been purchasing really since 2008 uh, well, 2008 is a little bit different, but you know we had a financial crisis in 2008 that was associated with the housing market. And so the Federal Reserve there to rescue banks that had many bad mortgages did something that they hadn't done. They'd purchased a lot of those bad mortgages secured, mor mortgage securities. That put money into banks or into the economic system. The more normal thing and the thing they've been purchasing relative to COVID our, our national debt. So when government, say with the um, COVID, what, what did they call it? The CARES Act, where they spent so much money, a couple trillion dollars, where right. did they get that money? They didn't get it by increasing taxes on all of us. They borrowed it, right? Well, individuals and banks and institutions across the world borrowed a good chunk of that money, that extra two trillion, but not all of it. The Federal Reserve, it seems, purchased about a trillion of the two trillion. 
rough numbers. I, I could be wrong. I might want to check that more carefully, but they bought a lot of it. You right. can see it in the data. Well, where is that money now? It's actually not out floating around in the economy. It is in banks. And uh, I guess I'll finish up by saying, why has, haven't banks just loaned that out? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. They want to make sure they get it back. So they have to be confident enough about the people they loan it to, uh, worried about default. But the other thing, and this is a major thing, is the Federal Reserve coming out of the 2008-9 financial crisis introduced a new tool. And that is they pay banks now interest on their excess reserves. So as a bank, if you have reserves, you don't have to loan them out to make things work. Um, you can receive interest rather for, than um, by making car loans, home loans, other loans, you can receive it from the Federal Reserve. And so the Federal Reserve is using that tool to let that money out into the economy slowly rather than rapidly, because if it went out rapidly, we would have both tremendous inflation, the quantity theory of money would predict, and we would also have even more potential for bubbles in the stock market, in bond markets, and in real estate. So long-winded, but hopefully that explains some things. Yeah, no, that was that was really helpful. Um, so thank you for that. And, you know, now the Fed has recently announced that it'll be buying $80 billion a month in treasuries and $40 billion a month in mortgage-backed securities. Um, do you think this will increase the risk of inflation further? And, and why do you think the Fed decided to pursue this course of action? Well, the why is easier. The, the why is the Federal Reserve has a very strong incentive now to keep interest rates relatively low. Uh, they wouldn't have to because they're somewhat independent of the national government. But as you know, we have more. I don't know. I looked at the national debt clock recently. It's gone up pretty fast, though, right? Mm -hmm. 20, 22 to 26 trillion. I'm not sure exactly where we're at. Uh, if you looked at our national debt in the 1980s, now we would we would just love to have a debt level that small. Uh, but interest rates were very high in the early 1980s. And so if you looked at interest as a share of our national government's budget in the 1980s, it would be higher than it is today, even though we have all this debt. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because interest rates have come way down. So I know you're into real estate. Well, you had home mortgage rates in 1981 of over 20%, if you can imagine that. <laughs> yeah, that that means for the same value of home, you know, on a 30-year mortgage, most of your payment is interest. Mm -hmm. If you have five times the interest rate, you're going to have five times the payment roughly on the same home. And so you could see how that could kill the housing market. So the Federal Reserve would be a little concerned about that. But just think of what would happen to government's budget if instead of paying the interest rates it's paying now, they had to pay five times the interest rate. Pretty much all of our tax dollars would have to go for interest alone. And so there is a tremendous pressure on the Fed to keep interest rates low. And that's why they buy up those securities. If they didn't, then... How will the federal government borrow more money? The only way is to let the interest rate rise. So other people other than the Fed will uh, borrow that money. So that's the why. Now, I forget the other part of your question. Uh, do, you, do you think it'll increase the risk of inflation further? Well, it increases it in that it puts more reserves out there. And so it makes it that much more important that the Federal Reserve not let the air out of the excess reserve balloon or the banking reserve balloon too quickly. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and now, you know, you, you just touched on interest rates being low. Uh, Fed Chairman Powell mentioned that he doesn't foresee increasing interest rates till the very least, you know, 2023. And on top of this, he states that he hopes, you know, inflation will increase to around 2%. Do you think we'll start seeing this happen? Well, the main reason inflation is low now, I would say, is because of all the COVID shutdowns um, and people don't have income, they're nervous, so they're not spending. You might think, well, with a shutdown, you lose supply, so it creates shortages, and I think that has happened. Some things, the prices have gone up, but also there's still enough unemployment and nervousness about the future that people aren't spending. <laughs> 
And so I, I think they, they're saying they want more inflation. Inflation has come down. It's in the high ones now, 1% to 2%. Their target has typically been 2%. Um, the bigger challenge they'll have is once the vaccinations start to take effect and the economy opens up, there's all this money out there. They're going to be back to trying to keep it down to 2% rather than up. And so I don't think they'll have a problem raising it to the 2%. I think the bigger problem is, will they be able to keep it down with all this money out there? Yeah. And, and that, that leads to, you know, the big question and kind of the elephant in the room. Do you think there's a risk of hyperinflation for all the money we have printed recently? There is, but the interesting thing, I think the bigger risk right now is bubbles bursting like we've seen in the past. So if you look at stock valuations, if you look at real estate, if you look at bonds, pretty much every savings vehicle, uh, you look at it compared to history and you think this, these assets are pretty high priced. And so in the past, when other nations, not the U.S., have gotten into debt trouble, um, they normally haven't paid it off. Um, the people who have suffered have been people who, who lent that money, and then inflation devalues the debt. So the inflation tax is the typical way that debt has been repaid. This time, uh, and, and there's another concept here, if the inflation rate goes up, interest rates will go up. And that's because savers, it's the Fisher effect is the formal effect. And so uh, the Federal Reserve has a strong incentive to try to keep inflation from growing because they cannot control nominal interest rates if <clears throat> they don't control inflation. And so it's a tough go. As I talked to you a little bit about uh, before we got on here, coming out of the 2008 and 9 financial crisis, the Federal Reserve had purchased a lot of assets, mortgage-backed securities mainly, to, to try to help with that crisis. And they had done, in my view, a masterful job of keeping all those excess reserves in banks from being loaned too quickly and keeping inflation close to that 2% target. And over about a five-year period, they reduced those reserves from three trillion or so to two trillion, if I remember the numbers. So it took about five years to reduce it to uh, to two trillion. They had another maybe ten years to go to get it back down to the trend. Well, now because of COVID, <laughs> we've bumped up way more. Than, than it took them five years. So if you look at the time horizon based upon how they had been doing it before, we're talking decades of, of policy to try to prevent inflation. So I would say, yes, there is a pretty big risk. It's conceivable that they can do it, um, but I think there's a pretty big risk and we're gonna do more, right? It, it seems, so yeah. Yeah, um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good news on that front. But, you know, let's hope that, you know, we have people in power that can can take on the task. Um, so I think my final question is, do you have any advice you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, I'm thinking about this for myself. If If there's inflation and you have a relatively fixed retirement, and I don't know, is Social Security indexed to inflation now if it is then then you're if it's not then people's retirements if if you have social security or you have some fixed income so thinking about how to protect your retirement from inflation i think is wise the traditional things there are hard assets like gold um, i think one reason people have gone into real estate is people have to have a place to live so I would probably go into residential housing rather than commercial, but um, rents will tend to go up with inflation. And so I would expect that that might be a place money would go, but gold and a bit, I, I personally don't know enough about these alternative currencies, Bitcoin and that to invest in them, but they're going crazy. Um, so people are doing that. 
I think there's a lot of volatility in the in the cryptocurrencies right now and kind well, of there's a lot of volunteer volatility in every asset and it's because two things are working against one another on the one hand there's a lot of money out there and you it, and if you are concerned about inflation do you just hold money well that doesn't make sense you just lose it all right mm-hmm. and so people are putting it into stock bonds and real estate because they don't want to earn earn 0.1% in their bank account, right? When inflation is 2%. And so you got to find something at the same time, you look at the valuations and they're overvalued. And so are you going to be the one who's holding the stocks when they're, when the price is cut in half? Uh, So people are nervous and when stocks go down, they get out. And so I would expect continued volatility and maybe increasing volatility, even in things like real estate prices, because, they're so high priced that that there may well be a bubble um, or bubbles that that burst. And so I think when you think about how we'll ultimately get out of this, I think there are two potentials. The traditional way is inflation and just people who are holding cash or have more retirements that aren't protected by inflation, they pay the price. The other way is bubbles bursting. And so I think we'll probably see a see both it's hard to know and the trouble is everything's fine everything's fine until it happens and then it happens all at once and you know that's the way when bubbles burst that's the way it tends to happen so i would expect some wealthy people right not just poor poorer people are disproportionately affected by inflation uh wealthier people are disproportionately affected by the bubbles bursting and so hard to predict which of those will will happen more i would predict more of the bubbles than the inflation because the federal reserve has such a strong incentive to try to control that that's a that's an interesting take because you know a lot of economists agree right now that we're in a k-shaped recovery but if you're if what you're saying is true that would help us go back to a somewhat an equilibrium if both sectors are kind of hit in, in that sense, you know, with the wealthier people getting hit with the bubbles more than um, the, you know, less fortunate people getting hit with inflation. So I think that's that's an interesting way to look at it. I hadn't I hadn't thought of that uh, myself. Yeah. yeah, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, unless you're hit by a truck, you'll get to live through it. So, <laughs> so yes. Yeah, yeah it's hard to predict what will happen next, but it's good to to see all the different possibilities. And I think, um, I hope our listeners can, can kind of understand it and, and decide for themselves what they think they should do. Yeah, well, it's not a, not a simple thing. I think, the, I think one of the best insights though for me, maybe I'll leave you with this. If you have more questions, it's fine. But uh, when I think about inflation and the quantity theory of money, it was really eye-opening to me to just recognize money has two places to go. And that's why predicting what will happen is difficult. If it disproportionately goes into assets, then it creates can create bubbles and that you have that problem. If it disproportionately goes into goods and services, you have inflation and that problem. And the, the Federal Reserve can control a little bit where that goes, but it's people's behavior. I mentioned that earlier. It just depends upon us. If we're saving oriented, it goes into the assets and you have the bubble situation. If we, if we want to spend, we, we have more of the inflation. So we've been putting it more into the assets, I think. And so that's where we at now. Assets of all types uh, are highly valued. And yeah, not so much inflation, which is a blessing, right? Uh, <laughs> we've really been blessed, but there, there may come this reckoning, right? To where... Yeah, you get hammered with that's, one of those two. Yeah, that's what I've been when, been warning people about because I said, you know, it's it's great until you know we have to, you know, accept what's happening. You know, with the eviction moratoriums, I keep saying we're we're kicking the can down the road, you know, and you know, a two thousand dollars stimulus check may not help people's back uh, pay and 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 all the 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 back rent that they owe. So um, we'll see what happens. Uh, right. you know, I hope I hope you know we can get out of this unfazed, but it's looking more and more unlikely that that'll happen. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I, you know, I really appreciate you and all your insight. And hopefully we'll have you on uh, again. Happy to do it. You're doing a great work here. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you get a chance to check out the entire podcast episode. It won't disappoint. It's available on all your favorite podcast streaming platforms.